Suspense. Tonight, it's Miss Rita Hayworth as star of Three Times Murder, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Suspense. Radio's outstanding theater of thrills is presented for your enjoyment and bring you Rita Hayworth as Laura with Hans Conried as Elmer in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! One of the most thrilling World Series in recent baseball history. And now, the exclusive that I promised you earlier in the program. A report so sensational that I'm going to devote all of my remaining time to it. I have before me a copy of a document delivered in person today to the district attorney's office by one Fredonia Bell. Fredonia Bell was the trusted personal maid of Laura Starling Morton, whom you will remember from the widely publicized murder trial of just four months ago. This document is a statement written by Laura Starling Morton in her own hand, and it begins as follows. Quote, I only regret that it will be impossible for me to be present when this is read aloud. What I shall, what I shall relate here concerns three men. Of these three men, it is not on behalf of my husband, Robert, that I write, nor on behalf of my husband, Charles. This is for Elmer. But I don't think that Elmer will ever see it. For Elmer, too, is going to die. Laura? Laura? Yes, Robert? Laura, where's my electric razor? In the medicine cabinet, where it always is. Oh, for the love of... No, Robert, I wish you wouldn't shave while you're in the bathtub that way. What's the difference, darling, where I shave? I like to shave in the bathtub. Well, I just don't like to see you meddling with electricity while you're in there. You might get a shock or something. Yes, sure, sure, Mrs. Thomas Edison. <sighs> All right, so go ahead. I don't care. Listen, darling, listen. I like to shave in the bathtub. I'm relaxed in a bathtub. I read in a bathtub. I think in a bathtub. And I'm not going to change my habits even for you. <sighs> I know, dear. I suppose that is a lot to expect. Oh, boy. Robert. Then I stood in the door of the bathroom and looked. A good, long look. Then I called a doctor. The doctor called the police. The police called the district attorney. And I found myself confronted by a young man with red hair and glasses who gave the immediate impression of being clever, unscrupulous, and objectionable. That was Elmer. Mrs. Williams, I'm Elmer Garner of the district attorney's office. How do you do, Mr. Garner? I thought that you and I'd better have a little private chat. What about, Mr. Garner? About your husband. What about my husband? Ms. Williams, I'm going to be very frank with you on a number of counts. I'm what's known as an assistant district attorney. My Mr. Job... Garner, I have just lost my husband. I hardly I'm think... I'm coming to that, Mrs. Williams. The district attorney has put me on this case because he thinks he doesn't have a case. Routine investigation. Now, maybe that's because a D.A. is essentially a nice man with nice instincts. And I'm not, but I don't agree with it. About what? About not having a case. Because I can smell them, Mrs. Williams. I can smell them a mile away. What can you smell, Mr. Garner? Murder. Oh, oh I see. <laughs> good. Your attitude's very good. No phony hysteria, no fake indignation. Realistic. I like that. I'm that way myself. Mr. Garner. I'm trying my best to maintain my composure under trying circumstances. And I must say, your extraordinary insinuation does not make it any easier. Now, look, I know you killed him. You know that I know you killed him. Mr. Garner. Now, I said I was going to be very frank with you, Miss Williams. I am. On your side of the story is the fact that although I know you killed him, it may be a little difficult to prove that you killed him. Not too difficult, but a little. I should think it might, since it's utterly untrue. Yeah. Now, let's see what cards I hold. You're a laboratory technician. You were before you married, anyway, right? Right. And your technical knowledge would have told you that a man using a faulty electrical appliance while sitting in a tub full of water stood an excellent chance of electrocuting himself. I also know that a man firing a bullet into his head would stand an excellent chance of killing himself. Well, 
But the insulation on the cable of that electric razor was frayed. Now, that might have happened through normal wear. It also might have happened because it was tampered with by you. And then again, as you say, it might not. Would it surprise you to know that we've got your fingerprints all over that razor? It would surprise me more if you hadn't. Or on everything else in the house, for that matter, Mr. Garner. Uh-huh. <laughs> You're a very intelligent woman, Mrs. Williams. You're right. It would have looked funny. You were smart not to wipe off those prints. Very smart, eh? Thank you. However, so much for the means. Now for the motive. We can't establish, of course, that you and your husband didn't get along. Unfortunately, but... you could establish that about many husbands and wives. And that your husband was insured for $50,000 in your favor. And that there's about 50000 more in community property and that you inherit, right? Naturally. Well, $100,000 is quite a nice little motive, Miss Williams. But it doesn't prove anything, does it, Mr. Garner? Well, that depends on how it's used by the prosecuting attorney. That's me, you know. I know. Do you have a lawyer, Mrs. Williams? Not yet. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're a very intelligent woman, Mrs. Williams. That would have looked bad, too, if you had a lawyer right on tap. But you're going to need a lawyer, you know. So it would appear. All right. What about me? You. Sure, I'm a lawyer. You just finished telling me that you would be the prosecuting attorney. Well, that's just the point. Why well, spend a lot of money on a lawyer who probably can't get you off anyway when you can spend it on me and have a sure thing? See? Yes, I see. All I want is half. $50,000. No. What's the matter, too much? No. Now, look here, sister. You don't seem to realize that I'm in a position, depending on how I handle this case, either to set you free or to hang you. That, Mr. Garner, is where we disagree. You mean you're willing to gamble and I can't do it, huh? If you, if you wish to put it that way. All right. But $50,000 is going to look cheap. Cheap when they slip that noose around your neck. And there she sits, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, cold, calm, emotionless. The same Laura Williams who carefully calculated, carefully planned and premeditated the murder of her husband. I ask the death penalty. I must ask it. For ponder well, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if you set her free, if you set her free, believe me, this will not be the last accident to mark the bloody trail through life of Laura Williams. And when that accident occurs, when the next victim is struck down, his innocent blood will be on your hands. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? Uh, we have, Your Honor. What is your verdict? Uh, on the grounds of insufficient evidence, we find the defendant not guilty. <laughs> Well, Mrs. Williams, I guess the sporting thing is to say congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Garner. I'll say one thing. You got what it takes. You know, the jury was evenly divided the whole first day. Do you know that? Yes, I knew it. Uh, so I wasn't too far wrong at that, was I? Just far enough, Mr. Garner. Say, so listen. Uh, again, just a sporting proposition. Tell me. Did you? Did I what? Oh, come on. We're alone here anyway. It doesn't matter because you can't be tried twice for the same thing. You know that, don't you? Yes, I know it. Well, did you? Yes! You cheap, contemptible blackmailer! Yes! I killed him! How do you like that? I killed him! Suspense, bringing you Rita Hayward with Hans Conrad in Three Times Murder, a radio play by John DeWitt and Robert L. Richards in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. And now, back to our Hollywood soundstage, Rita Hayward, who, as Laura Starling Morton, continues the reading of a document in Three Times Murder. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. (laughs) 
Perhaps I gambled too recklessly with Elmer. I have since had cause to wonder. But there were things that I could not foresee as well as Elmer. Suffice it to say that after my acquittal with $100,000 from Mother's estate, I moved into another city and took up my life again under another name. That there is Laura Starling. I met and married Charles Morton, a charming and eccentric man of twice my age, whose genius as a research chemist accounted not only for those qualities which endeared him to me, but for a very considerable personal fortune as well. That my conscience bothered me not in the least, and I was quite happy, and that as the years went by, I had seen, I thought, the last of Elmer. Coffee? Well, you said you wanted coffee. It's ready now. No, but I have some coffee. Well, you took that out there three hours ago. Now come in and get your coffee. <laughs> yes. In a, in a moment, my dear. As soon as I finish here. Yes. Charles, you come out of that smelly laboratory and have your coffee. Besides, I have a surprise for you. Oh, you yes. have? Well, I'll be right in. And bring that other coffee cup with you. Yes, yes, yes. Now, yes. oh, what's all this surprise? No. Right. Oh, yes. <laughs> Seems to have left my glasses in the oh, laboratory. Charles, you're simply priceless. Oh, it's a cake. It's a cake, yes. Well, this is our anniversary, darling. Our fourth anniversary. It is? Oh, why, so it is. Oh, Laura, this is so thoughtful of you. I... <laughs> I'm afraid I'm hopeless, my dear. I know it's the husband who should be thoughtful, but I... <laughs> you're just you, darling. Now sit down and relax for a while. Oh, yes. Oh, uh, here's your cup. Thank you. Charles. What's in that cup? The coffee. Charles, I'm sure that even in the atomic age, coffee does not come in the form of white crystal. Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I, I, I'd finished my coffee and I was doing some other things there. Charles, what is it? The thiochloride. You see, at the moment, I'm testing... Charles! What? Why, that's deadly poison. Well, so it is. You see, the thiocene radical follows its oh, tendency... Oh, Charles, to... I, I wish you wouldn't mix things up in the cups and dishes that way. It's, it's dangerous. Dangerous? Well, suppose you got the cups mixed up. Suppose you oh, drank it. Good heavens, Laura. Half the stuff we use in chemistry is dangerous if you go to drink it. But who's going to do that? It's like, uh, well, like eating soap. You wash your hands with it every day, but who'd think of eating it? Huh? <laughs> well, now, you take that cup right back out to the laboratory and empty it and wash it out. Oh, yeah, all right. Charles? Yes? I was wondering, since it's our anniversary... Yes? Let's go out to dinner and celebrate. Why, well, yes. Yes, I think, I think that's a splendid idea. And it... Oh, my goodness. What? I completely forgot. My brother's coming to see us today. Your brother? Well, my half-brother. Charles, I, I didn't know you had a brother. Oh, didn't you? Well, you see, he's been in the Army for almost five years. He just got back a short time ago... Got wire yesterday saying he's passing through town and he'd like to see me. So I thought that. Does he know you're married? Why, I suppose. Uh, well, I suppose he doesn't. As a matter of fact, we've never been very close. Neither of us much letter writing, you know, so on. But he's the only relative I've got. And all the sympathy I've wasted on you because I thought you were an orphan or something. Oh, I was, practically. When's he coming? Why, uh, this afternoon sometime, I think. Well, <laughs> I guess there's your answer. I am sorry, my dear. Why, Charles, that's all right. Maybe your brother would like to go out and celebrate with us. Well, right here. Hello there. Hello, Charlie. Come in, come in. And I want you to meet my wife. Laura, this is my brother, Elmer. There was no doubt that it was Elmer. There was no doubt but what he recognized me. And there was no doubt in my mind as to how he intended to play his hand this time either. For he gave no public sign of recognition, but simply looked straight at me. And smile, and smile, and smile. So, you've gone into private practice, eh, Elmer? Criminal law, I suppose? Mm-hmm. Well, there's no appreciation in this country of men who hold public office, financially at least. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Elmer, you always did have your eye on the dollar, didn't you? <laughs> what about your racket, Charlie? What have you been up to? Huh? Oh, just puttering around here in my laboratory. You mean right here at home? Oh, of course. Oh, I guess that's new since you were here last. Well, there's a lot that's new since I was here last. Yes, he's right in there, right through those doors. Yeah. Isn't that sort of a nuisance for a wife, or isn't it? Not in the least. 
Why should it be? Oh, now, Laura, don't try to cover up my feelings. <laughs> Just before you came, she was scolding me for carrying tire chlorate around in the family coffee cups. <laughs> well, now, isn't that interesting? Isn't that a coincidence? Why? I was just thinking what a fine setup for a murder. Somebody poisons the chemist in his own laboratory. It looks just like an accident, isn't he? <laughs> You'll find that Elmer has a morbid mind, my dear. He used to try people for murder back in Illinois. Oh, I tried some beauties, too. <laughs> well, I've got to get along. Uh, sorry I can't accept your invitation for tonight. Well, but you are staying over for a few days, aren't Oh, you? yes, yes, yes. I'll see you again. Soon. Well, good, good. Oh, don't bother to come to the door with me, Charlie. I... Oh, you want to get back to work? Well, as a matter uh, of fact, Perhaps that... Laura will, huh? Give us a little chance to get acquainted. Why, yes, of course. Well, uh, call us, Elmer, don't forget. Oh, you can depend on it, Charlie. Well, well, well. Little Laura Williams. What do you want? What do you think old Charlie would say if he knew? I asked you a question. Well, I suppose he'd go on loving you in his own peculiar fashion. Never be quite the same, though, would it? There'd always be that little gnawing down, huh? Uh, I'm afraid things would be kind of under strain around here, Laura. You do have a price, I suppose. Am I? <laughs> By the way, why are you so eager to pay at this time? I'm happy here. I'm at peace with myself and the world. I don't want anything to... to change. No other reason? What other reason would there be? I suppose all this property would go to you in the event of another little, uh, accident, huh? You don't really believe that. The motive and the means. Money and poison. How much, Elmer? Oh, no, 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 no. You've got me wrong, Laura. I don't want money. When did that happen? <laughs> did it ever occur to you that I might simply be interested in my brother's, uh, welfare? No. All that has occurred to me so far is to wonder why I had to pick the one man in the world who's related to you. You want to hear my proposition? I'm waiting. The motive and the means. Well, there's always the means for an intelligent person such as you, Laura, but if we took away the motive... The motive? The money. The will. No motive, no temptation, you see? I see. And in a way, of course, that's for your own protection, too, because if Charlie ever so much as slipped on a banana peel and you inherited that money... There isn't a jury in the world that wouldn't convict you, Laura, simply on your past record. You realize that, don't you? Yes. So, you see, no motive and no case either, you see? What do you want me to do? Get him to change his will. In favor of his only living relative, I presume. Uh-huh. That's me. And then? Well, that's all. You're in the clear, because after that, Charlie couldn't suspect you, even if I told him. They probably wouldn't believe it. Throw me out of the house for persecuting his little bride. Maybe even change his will right back again, you see? All right. You can do it, can't you? I suppose so. Oh, I know you can. I know you'd better. Darling, I don't want your money. I only want you. I know, but after all, I'm considerably older than you are, my dear, and chances are that someday... No. The whole idea of losing you and then and then profiting by it, it's, it's just hateful. But uh, who else would I leave it to? Leave it to your brother. Elmer? Why not? It doesn't matter, but... It... Well, I... Oh, please, darling. For me. All right, my dear. If it really makes a difference to you. Now, don't you worry about it anymore. I'll take care of it sometime. No, I want you to do it now, right away, today. Well, I, I'd have to get in touch with my lawyer. I'll call him for you. I'll get him on the phone right now. <laughs> my goodness, Laura. You act as though it were a matter of life or death. Ambassador Hotel. Mr. Elmer Garner, please. Thank you. Yeah. This is Laura. Uh-huh. It's all right. It's all arranged. Is there? Yes, the lawyer's coming tomorrow. You sure? Well, I was standing by the phone while he talked to him. Did he tell the lawyer what changes he wanted made? Yes, he did. Not that I think you'd ever tell a lie, Laura, but uh, how do I know this is all true? Hasn't he told you? No. Well, then perhaps you'd better drop by this evening. Well, that's more like it. I'll expect you after dinner. I'll be there. L. 
Palmer arrived this evening, less than an hour ago. We were having coffee in the living room. Earlier, Charles had been showing him through the laboratory. It was not until after that that I had a moment to speak to him alone. Oh, wonderful ch fellow, old Charlie. So trusting. Did he tell you? Oh, what? The will. Oh, that, yes. It uh, seems that I am to be old Charlie's beloved heir. <laughs> he still can't understand it. Are you satisfied, then? My dear Laura, I was never more satisfied in all my life. Almost evens things up, doesn't it? Almost. You never forgot that, did you? That you lost. Lost? Who says I lost? The game isn't over till the whistle blows, says, huh? It is for you. Now get out of here. Okay. Okay, all in good time. Yeah, sorry I had to leave you, but those reactions have to be checked every hour, you That's know. all right, Charlie. Laura and I were just going over old times in Illinois. You didn't know we uh, both came from Illinois, did you? No. No, I hadn't realized. Oh, I'm sure I told you, Charles. You must have forgotten. Oh, yes, yes. Well, all right. Uh, coffee ready? Yes. Will you have coffee with us, Elmer? Oh, you bet I will. Anything in it? No, nothing, my. Charles always, always takes his black pill. Laura does make the best coffee. Well, here's to Laura's coffee. There was something about his smile when he said it. That smile. And then all of a sudden I saw it. I saw the whole terrible thing. Uh. Don't. Don't drink it. Charles! <laughs> Charlie seems to have keeled over. Charles! Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if that was thiochlorate poisoning. Oh, what a fool. Fool. What a fool. Uh-huh. The motive and the means. And the motive is the real beauty this time, Laura, because you had to kill him before he changed his will. Me, huh? Eh? You killed him. Sure, but that's not what the jury's got to think. Oh. And, of course, I'll get the money anyway. You couldn't very well collect oh. Because they're going to hang you, Laura. They're going to hang you. Elmer is downstairs in the living room. I am in my study. And once more, I am waiting for the police. There is no escape for me, of course. Elmer knows that. But there's one little thing that he has forgotten. The last play of the game. For I've just drawn up a will of my own, leaving my property and everything that I inherit from Charles to Elmer. It's dated three days ago. This statement I shall give into the safekeeping of my personal maid, Fredonia Bell, who, after all is said and done, has been the one true friend I've ever had. I shall give it to her with certain instructions for its eventual disposal which I know she will follow to the letter. When that is done, I have beside me a glass of water. It contains thiochlorate, the motive and the means. Because, you see, when the police come, it is Elmer who will have to do the explaining, not I. And he will have to explain two bodies. Charles? And mine. But the irony of the document, ladies and gentlemen, the terrible irony is that it was delivered to the district attorney's office by Fredonia Bell this evening at 8 o'clock. And why did the good Fredonia wait until now? Because she was thus following explicitly the instructions of her mistress, Laura Starling Morton, whom she adored, and who specified that the envelope be handed to the police exactly 24 hours after the execution of Elmer Garner. Good night. Ken Niles, and it's my exceedingly pleasant duty, Miss Hayworth, A, to compliment you in the name of some 20 million listeners who must have loved your performance just now, and B, to present to you this gift basket of grand estate wines 
with the compliments of Roma. Oh, thank you, Mr. Niles. <laughs> Good night, Rita. Good night. Next Thursday, same time, Suspense. Produced and directed by William Spear. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.